Good morning. Morning.
Hi, Alana. Hi, Maurice. Can you hear me okay? Uh, a little low in volume. I sign up. Yes. Maurice, how's that sound level? Still on the low side, but we can hear you. Huh. All right. I think Liz is having some issues getting in. All right, we'll wait a minute or two for her to see if she can get in. Oh, there she is. All right, she can hear me, right? Yes, I can. Good morning, everyone. Great, Liz, you're here. All right, it's 930. Let's get started. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Liz Kukla. I'm the secretary of the Board of Zoning Appeals, and I'm going to read the preamble for you this morning. In compliance with notification requirements of the city's open meeting law in section 101.021 of the codified ordinances of Cleveland, Ohio, 1976, notice of this meeting has been publicly posted. All boards and commissions under the purview of the city planning department conducts its meetings according to Robert's rules of order. Actions during the meeting will be taken by voice vote. Abstentions from any vote due to a conflict of interest should be stated for the record prior to the taking of any vote. In order to ensure that everyone participating in the meeting have the opportunity to be heard, we ask that you use the raise hand feature before asking a question or making a comment. 
The raise hand feature can be found in the participants panel on the desktop and mobile version and activated by clicking the hand icon. Please wait for the chair or facilitator to recognize you and be sure to select unmute and announce yourself before you speak. When finished speaking, please lower your hand by clicking on raise hand icon again and mute your microphone. We will also be utilizing the chat feature to communicate with participants. The chat feature can be activated by clicking the chat button located on the bottom of the WebEx screen. Please note that call-in users can unmute by using star six. Next screen, Maurice. All meeting activity is being recorded via the WebEx platform. These proceedings are also being live streamed via YouTube for public view. We provided a link to the meeting for those who wish to speak on a particular case via our website and email. All requests to speak on a particular matter have been considered. We have also received emails from those who have provided written comment on a particular matter. Back to you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Can you go ahead and call the roll, please? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Ms. Barnes did contact me this morning and stated she would be out. Um, so, Ms. Brown? Present. Ms. Bate? Present. Ms. Britt? Here. Madam Chair, we have a quorum. Okay, any postponements or withdrawals today? We do have one withdrawal that is up on the screen right now for those of us who can't see the screen. It is calendar number 21-176 regarding 15736 Lorraine Avenue. Dean Pack is owner and Prakana Brown proposed to establish use as assembly meeting party venue in a local retail business district. The owner of this property contacted us last week to request a withdrawal in this case. All right, so anyone here for this case, you can leave. Madam Chair, it appears we have uh, Councilman Slife here. So should we move to his we agenda item? To his, yes. Give me just one second, please. I'm having a little technical difficulty. All right. Uh, so, as a courtesy to the council people, uh, when they are present, we take their cases first. Uh, so, with that, uh, we are going to move forward to calendar number 22-031. This is at 4600 Rocky River Drive. The Cleveland Muslim Community Center owner proposes to construct a building addition, including an 8,500 square foot gymnasium in an A1 one family residential district in a B2 two family residential district. The owner appeals for relief from the strict application of the Cleveland codified ordinances of which there are 3 and number 3 is 341.02 which states that the review and approval of city planning commission is required. And with that to Ms. Brown for the oath. Good morning. I'm swearing in all who are present for this case. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give is the whole truth and nothing but the truth? Please raise your hand, reply I do, state your name and your address, please. Beyond Sam Pat, 22082 Lorraine Road, Fairview Park, Ohio. Adam Davenport, City Planning, 601 Lakeside Avenue. Ben Campbell, West Park Cams, Neighborhood Development, 17407 Lorraine Avenue. Charles Slice, 601 Lakeside. Anyone else for this case? Who would like to give testimony? Okay, Madam Chair. Thank you. History to property, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. This property was originally split between general retail and two family in 1929. In 1944, it was placed entirely in the two family district. 
In our records administration office, I found that in 1951, a permit was issued to erect a brick veneer church. 1953, a storage shed was erected on the property. 1962, an addition to the church was erected. And again, in 1963, there was another addition for the uh, on the building. Um, in our cell system, I found that there were over 100 documents for in exterior and, and interior alterations. I think the most pertinent information was that in 2008, there were alterations to change use from daycare to school. Uh, 2013, a permit was issued to erect a new building. 2014 and 2015, there were permits to erect the industrialized trailer um, classroom units on the property. 2016, a temporary use was granted for 30 days for Ramadan celebration. Uh, 817 occupations were identified on that permit. Um, 2017, permit was issued to build a 204 car parking lot. And then in 2018, a permit was issued to erect an addition on the southeast side. And that's all that I have, Madam Chair. Thank you. Legal standard, please. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board. Helen is requesting an area variance from the off street parking regulations of the zoning code, as well as permission to operate a recreation slash community center building in a residential district. To obtain the area variance, appellant must prove that denying the request will create a practical difficulty not generally shared by others land or buildings in the same district will deprive the appellant of substantial property rights and the granting the variance not be contrary to the purpose and intent of the zoning code. Pursuant to section 337.02 G3B, a recreation slash community center building may be approved in a one or two family district if the board finds after public notice and public hearing that adequate yard spaces and other safeguards to preserve the character of the neighborhood are provided. And if in the judgment of the board, such buildings and uses are appropriately located and designed and will meet the community need without adversely affecting the neighborhood. All right, thank you. Uh, who will be the spokesperson for this case? Leon Sampat, Ellis Architects. Okay, Mr. Sampat, go ahead. So, yeah, hello. Uh, I'm here to represent uh, the Cleveland Muslim Community Center. Uh, they are proposing a 13,500 square foot uh, st structure, uh, which includes the 8,500 square foot gymnasium. Um, they've been growing. Uh, they want to try to keep their their community together. And by doing this, they want the kids to enjoy the sports activities. Uh, we are proposing uh, locker rooms, uh, indoor gymnasium. Uh, we do have some outdoor uh, courts scheduled to uh, be in the parking lot at the northeast. Um, as for parking, typically the, the, the lot is pretty uh, vacant, uh, except for Fridays between 1 and 2 o'clock. Uh, that is when uh, they do their service, uh, and, and at that time, they usually have uh, police officers always present uh, to help direct traffic, but uh, any other time, uh, the, the lot is usually is, is not in a, a full capacity. Um, so we feel that the, this addition will not be uh, harmful for the neighborhood. I don't think anybody has any questions. Uh, we have the exterior, we are matching the existing uh, masonry structure uh, and then at the at the higher parts of the gymnasium we we've, we've gone with the metal siding uh, to kind of break it up uh, and we feel that this will give kind of a cohesive design for the building uh, can you just talk about uh, just quickly uh, what um, what kind of activities you are going to have in this building I think I remember you saying um, so yeah, it'll be so like recreation, like gymnasium, basketball, correct. that kind of stuff. Okay. Yeah, so basketball, soccer. Uh, there will be a workout facility, uh, you know, treadmills, um, weightlifting, and then there is a locker room for showering and, and toiletries and changing. Okay, thank you. Um, I will go to the CDC, Mr. Campbell. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board. Um, we, we don't have an issue with the uh, uh, 
building of the gymnasium and, and whatever approvals are needed, um, it obviously makes sense having a school on the site that they would have an indoor facility for the kids to uh, to exercise and so on. Um, so we have no issue with with those uh, variances. However, we uh, we would oppose the granting of the uh, relief from the design review, which we consider a uh, very important tool to keep uh, the visual appearance of our corridors and main streets. Uh, you know. We're, we're up to the standards we, the neighborhood would like to see. So we we support the, the building of the gym, but we would like it to go through the design review process. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I don't think not going before design review is before us today. Um, Correct. We, actually, we actually presented <laughs> uh, at the design review. Uh, we've, we've gotten feedback from them and we've actually made some modifications based on their feedback. Uh, we're adding additional landscaping. Uh, the drive is going to be shifted up, uh, and we do intend on going back to get final approval from them. Okay, thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, this is Lori Wagner. Just to clarify for the person who testified, um, number three, that's why he thinks you're asking for a variance for design review, states that the review and approval of the City Planning Commission is required. However, the board does not have the authority to waive that review. Um, and so that's just put there because it is a condition of a building and housing permit. So we're really only dealing with one and two. Thank you. Madam Davenport. Thanks, Madam Chair. Uh, we don't have any issue with the, uh, the first two variances. Uh, I think it's a pretty smart expansion of the, the overall facility. Uh, as Leon stated, they have come before our design review committee for conceptual review, and we gave them some initial feedback on uh, uh, a few items and some previous um, landscaping from a, a different iteration of the the kind of the facility expansion before. So uh, it sounds like they'll they'll be coming back to our design review committee soon, but um, that's the only kind of contingent issue that we have at the moment. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, Council Ms. Life. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and I'll be very brief because I've got a baby on my lap that's making noises. Uh, but I'm uh, very supportive, uh, submitted a letter uh, that's now up on the screen uh, outlining my support and, and just briefly, you know, I think that uh, as, as others have stated, this is in line with kind of what you'd expect to see at a, at a school. Uh, and then also relative to the parking, uh, I'm, I'm working with uh, traffic engineering to figure out how we can maybe net some additional street parking spots on Rocky River Drive, uh, which would uh, get us about closer to break even of, of the spots that we're losing uh, in the parking lot. And it's traffic engineering does have a precedent for allowing, uh, you know, on street parking. Uh, temporarily, like in line with uh, the hours of, of religious services. Uh, so, so uh, that's I'm optimistic that that'll help alleviate any concerns about parking. Okay, thank you, Councilman. Uh, I will open it up to my board for uh, questions, comments, or motion. Uh, Madam Chair, this is Liz. Go ahead, Liz. I did receive a call this morning from a neighbor on Ferncliff. She stated that she was opposed. Um, she said she was concerned about the extra traffic and parking um, and mentioned the already um, uh, the extensive potholes that are on that street. So, and that was the extent of her concerns. Thank you. All right, don't we all have those potholes? Um, and Madam Chair, just wanted to point out the uh, petition that I have up on screen. Looks like it's been signed by a, uh, a majority of the uh, residents in the uh, neighborhood that are in support of the project. I see that. Okay, go ahead, Board. Uh, Madam Chair, since it sounds like we don't have any questions from the board. Uh, we appreciate uh, Councilman Slife being present and grooming the next council person with him this morning. Um, and uh, 
with regard to the uh, items number one and two uh, with testimony from city planning, uh, the CDC and the council person, it sounds like, um, excuse me, it sounds uh, we have, excuse me, we have support from for the project from those individuals. And uh, item number three, uh, is the approval of the city planning commission, which we cannot rule on. So I move that we go ahead and um, uh, approve the variances for uh, number one and two for this project. Would you like to make it conditional uh, for the city planning uh, approval before we ratify, or would you like to just move forward? We will just move forward. All right. So with that, I move that we approve uh, items number one and two. Member Brown, I second. Thank you, Ms. Brown, the second. Go ahead, call the roll, Ms. Cooper. Thank you, Madam Chair. Ms. Brown? Yes. Ms. Bade? Ms. Britt? Yes. Calendar 22-031 is granted. It'll be ratified next week and we will send the appellant a letter. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Madam Chair, we should probably make an announcement about the three members that we have here today. I was just yes. going to say that. Yeah, yep. I, I wrote that down and then got caught in the case and forgot. So thanks. Yep. Um, yeah, so uh, we have not been at full force uh, for a while now, but we've had four members and one of our members is absent today. So we only have three. So that means you have to get a unanimous vote. So if that is not um, if you don't want to roll the dice with that, then you may you may withdraw today and we'll put you back on the agenda later on. Um, that's your prerogative if that's what you want to do. So when we call your case and you feel like you, you know, want to postpone until um, the, then for the next time, then just let us know. Thanks, Liz. Okay, go ahead, Ms. Faith. All right, I'm correct that we do not have any other council people, right? No, I did not see any. All right, thank you. All right, so we will move back to the top of the agenda with calendar number 22-016. This is the appeal of David Hovis from the Landmarks Commission decision regarding exterior alterations at 1723 West 32nd Street. David and Jennifer Hovis, owners owners of 1732 West 32nd Street, appeal under the authority of Section 76-6B of the Charter of the City of Cleveland and Section 329.02D of the Cleveland Codified Ordinances from the decision of the City of Cleveland Landmarks Commission rendered on December 9th, 2021. One, to deny a certificate of appropriateness sought by the owners for a roof replacement and installation of solar panels. With that to Ms. Brown. I'm swearing in all who are present for this case. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give is the whole truth and nothing but the truth? Please raise your hand, reply, I do. State your name and your address, please. I do, David Hovis, 1723, West 32nd Street. I do, Donald Pettit, 601 Lakeside Avenue. I do, Carl Brunges, 601 Lakeside Avenue. Anyone else? Uh, Ian Fest, First Choice Roofing Company. Oh, also note that Councilman McCormick is going to be trying to join us here. He just texted me. And uh, Madam Chair, my name is Nate Hall. I'm an attorney from the law department. Uh, I'm just I'm appearing on behalf of the uh, Landmarks Commission, but don't intend to give any testimony this morning. Madam Chair. Thank you. Legal standard, please. 
Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board. Appellant is appealing an administrative decision. The standard of review to be applied is whether the administrative decision was illegal, arbitrary, capricious, unreasonable, or unsupported by the preponderance of substantial, reliable, and probative evidence. If the appellant fails to meet this burden, the administrative decision must be affirmed. All right, thank you. Um, who will be the spokesperson for this case? I will. And who's that? Uh, David Hovis. Okay, Mr. okay, Mr. Hovis, go ahead. Um, so, a bit of history on this house. We bought this house. Uh, fire damaged, condemned condition is seen on the left in 2010 uh, after an arson uh, burned down the house next door and damaged this house in the process. Uh, we did a full gut renovation, uh, returning the house to a single family home. And uh, we li I live here with my wife and two, two sons. Um, we did a deep energy retrofit, bringing the house from a 181 hertz rating down to 38, which is a 80% reduction in energy use. Next slide, please. Uh, we, we received numerous awards for this. Not many people were doing this kind of renovation at that time. The market was pretty pretty down. Uh, we did get the 2011 Ohio City Residential Preservation Award. We were featured on the 2011 Ohio City Home Tour. We had articles in Freshwater, Mag or Freshwater Cleveland Home Energy Magazine, as well as, next slide, um, the Cleveland Restoration Society and Cleveland Action Support Housing had a ad in Cleveland Magazine featuring our house. Um, and we've been featured in the Plain Dealer as, uh, you know, examples of people committed to raising, uh, living and raising a family in the city. We have also helped found Near West Intergenerational School, which currently occupies what would the otherwise be unoccupied old Kentucky school building across the park from our house. And our children go there. Next slide, please. Now, uh, we did completely redo the roof in the 2010 renovation, but by 2019, we started losing shingles. Uh, we got, we did eventually, it took a while, get somebody up there to repair those shingles, but we just kept losing more. Um, it is a high, steep roof, and it is really hard to get anybody who is willing to go up there and work on it. We had been planning to add solar uh, back in 2019, but because of the condition of the roof and needing to address that, that kind of derailed us. We thought we probably, we should have had at least another 10 years out of this roof, but um, we don't, the shingles uh, have, have not held up. Next slide, please. So in, in looking at replacement roof, we did look at multiple options. Uh, you know, we could put asphalt shingles, we could put steel shingles, we could put solar tiles, or we could put standing seam. Uh, next slide. So asphalt has not the great, world's greatest durability, and there have been a lot of quality problems in recent years on asphalt shingles. Um, it is compatible with solar, but you have to be extra careful that you don't uh, create a water leak in attaching the, the solar panel racks to the roof. Uh, next slide. Metal shingles would have an appearance more uh, more like uh, slate, which was probably what was originally on this roof. Um, looks terrific, but it can't be used with solar. It's not compatible. Uh, manufacturer doesn't recommend it. Next slide. Tesla uh, makes their solar tiles, which make a lot of news over the years, but the availability hasn't really been there. They don't actually currently have anybody in Ohio installing these. Um, Cost is high, and because technically you can try to get them, but then they, they tack on a, a huge additional cost um, to the tune of just $20,000 just for being out of state, which kind of sends things into, you know, way too expensive. It's not practical, and they're, they're way backed up. Next, next slide. Which brings us to the remaining option here, which would be standing seam metal. It is a historic roof. It's highly durable. We should expect it to last at least 50 years. Uh, it is also the preferred roof for adding solar because the panel racks can be clamped directly to the standing seams without adding additional perforations to the roof. So better protection for the house. 
um, in addition to, you know, being a more durable roof. Next slide, please. Uh, there are numerous existing standing seam roofs in Ohio City, many of which, you know, which also have been approved by the Landmarks Commission. It uh, is somewhat um, uh, puzzling as to why, you know, uh, you know, for example, 1800 Fulton, but new, all the, you know, these, these, as far as I know, have all been approved by Landmarks Commission. They're all over the place. Uh, next slide. In particular, 1800 Fulton, uh, you know, it was just redone in the last two years or so, um, and was moved from a asphalt shingle roof to standing seam metal. Um, so, there's that. Next slide. I, um, you know, I threw this in here just because this is something else that's going in in our neighborhood. You know, metal roof, and historic character. Well, here we are. Um, I, I also, I'm sorry, I had tried to submit something at the, and it won't let me. Um, there's also, a, also approved by the Landmarks Commission, 7708 Fulton, or sorry, uh, Franklin, uh, which had a, was changed from a, it's a different historic district, but it was changed from a uh, tie or a shingle asphalt shingle roof to a red standing seam metal roof with solar panels. Um, I had thought because it was a different historic district, it might not be as applicable. I've been told otherwise, so it, it should probably be considered. Anyway, uh, in order to more permanently fix the roof, we wanted to upgrade to a metal roof, uh, which would be more compatible with solar. We engaged First Choice Roofing, who has done similar roofs in the neighborhood, including the one at 7708 Franklin. Um, the plan was to put a standing seam with striations in the burnished slate color, uh, thinking that the house probably originally had a slate roof, so at least a slate colored roof would be uh, reasonable, you know, in terms of tying back to the historic uh, um, yeah, history of the house. Next slide. Uh, you know, the this would look roughly, you know, the seams would look roughly like this. This is my kind of inexpert rendering, but kind of just a general idea. Next slide. Uh, now, there aren't quite as many examples of solar in Ohio City, but there are some. Um, some of these aren't in the historic district, but the one in the upper right, 4110 Bridge, definitely is. Uh, and the solar panels in that case are, you know, visible from, clearly visible from the street and all the way up to the front of the house, uh, which, you know, in my case, the Landmarks Commission was objecting to for some reason, but here it is, it was approved, you know, and, you know, we do have solar on, on um, you know, uh, our, our local treasure Great Lakes Brewing Company, they have solar. Uh, top left is also a new construction house in our in our neighborhood with, again, solar coming all the way to the front edge. Um, so next slide. Uh, our, this is our, well, this is a preliminary proposed layout. Um, the actual final will be shown on a different slide. Uh, this array uh, should pay for itself in about eight years with a 30 year useful life. We would be reducing our carbon footprint by 20,000 pounds per year or 600,000 pounds over the life of the panels and offset about half of our total electric usage uh, on, on average typical year. Next slide. This is a, a little bit more uh, updated uh, uh, or what the uh, panel uh, installation would look like. Um, Panels have to go where the sun is, and in this case, that is the southern facing roof of the house. Um, and there's, you know, large areas where you can connect panels together, obviously more efficient for installation purposes. So next slide, please. Um, just a 3D rendering showing what uh, this would look like. And then next slide shows a, uh, a rendering of what this would look like from the street and what you would actually be able to see, uh, which is mainly just the panels on the front half of the roof there. Next slide, please. So uh, just in summary, we saved the house from demolition in 2010 and completed rehab with an award-winning deep energy retrofit. Our, you know, our current roof has not held up and we just do not trust current asphalt shingle options. I don't feel like rolling the dice again. It is so hard to get anybody to come up and work on the roof. 
um, at the moment and, and just in general, it is a high, steep roof. Nobody wants to go up there for a $200 patch job, um, but you can get people to go up there for a $50,000 re-roof, which is what I want to do and get this uh, settled like for the rest of my life. Um, I don't want to have to do this again. Uh, and then just say, standing team metal has been used extensively in the United States, you know, since the 1800s, you know, uh, in the 21st century, standing seam is the preferred roof material for rooftop solar installations. Um, a stroll around Ohio City will quickly find a dozen standing seam roofs on historic and new construction properties throughout the neighborhood. It hasn't uh, disturbed the historic character. Uh, um, and rooftop solar is an important part of long-term sustainability uh, for our house. Of, of this house, our city, and the planet. Next slide, please. So the basis of our appeal is that the Landmarks Commission has really acted very arbitrarily in denying both the standing seam and the solar installation. They have proved similar standing seam rooms in the past, past most notably at 1800 Fulton. Um, uh, there are fewer examples of solar installations, but 4110 Bridge is pretty similar with panels clearly visible from the street right up against the front edge of the roof. Uh, and, and at the end of the day, if solar is something that the city of Cleveland is going to support, solar panels simply have to go where the sun is. Uh, we can't wish they could move to the north side of the roof or anything like that. Um, so with that, I did also submit a, a video with from my Landmarks Commission hearing where multiple people from the city and the Landmarks uh, Commission um, repeatedly stated that they did not uh, essentially consider precedent to be binding or even relevant, uh, which, you know, I find a little baffling here, but uh, they, you know, I don't know if that can be played over this or not. Um, but I do think it uh, backs up my case of the, the Landmarks Commission behaving arbitrarily. Great. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Fest, did you have anything you wanted to add to that about, or are you just here for questions? Or maybe not here. Uh, he's on mute, I don't know. Well, I also note that Councilman McCormick is here. I don't know if you want, he, he, he jumped on from another meeting. I don't know if he could. And uh, there he is raising his hand. Okay, um, we'll call on the Councilman last. Um, we will move on to Mr. Pettit from Landmarks. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I will just briefly introduce this and then I will turn it over to my colleague. Carl Brunches, who has a presentation to show you. Uh, the commission disapproved this application for roof replacement and solar panels on December 9th of last year. Uh, it was first seen and reviewed by the Ohio City Design Review Committee, which is advisory to the commission. They unanimously disapproved it as well. Uh, we had a long, we had a long discussion on December 9th, uh, I would say that the, the major sticking point was the proposed material. Uh, the, the commission did not agree that asphalt shingle is an inferior product. We've, we've been using it for years on historic houses. It's usually an administrative approval. Uh, we, we have as Mr. Hovis pointed out, approved some metal roofs in the historic districts, uh, but there aren't many. And 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 asphalt and other products are are far more widely approved by the commission as being appropriate to historic buildings. Uh, we approve metal for new constructions, for additions, uh, for outbuildings, less visible locations. Uh, but again, I would point out that we look at every case on its own merits. Uh, 7708 Franklin, the example that Mr. Hobus brought up this morning, was approved by the commission, I believe, two years ago. Uh, 
because we felt it was appropriate to the period in which the house was built and the style of the house. It's a, it's a mid 19th century uh, Gothic revival cottage. And we felt in that case that it was an appropriate application. Uh, so the commission's issue was with the, with the material, I think. Some of the members would have supported a more traditional looking standing seam roof, but but most of the members thought that that uh, that asphalt shingle was a, a good material and an appropriate material for this house. We do approve solar. Our goal is always to mitigate the visual impact. I can't speak for every single application we've ever approved. Uh, you know, I think it was the desire of the commission to table the pro project to to allow for further discussion and and look to look at alternatives. Uh, the applicant asked us to take action uh, on the ninth, uh, so the commission disapproved the project unanimously. Uh, again, I think the the major issue was with the proposed material, uh, and I would. Just like to turn this over to my colleague Carl Brunges to uh, talk about our standards and and uh, and he has a presentation to show you too. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pettit. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll reiterate with that all projects are considered on a case by case basis. And although examples of similar products and treatments may exist in a community, the circumstances that allowed for those treatments may not exist for the project under consideration. Precedence is considered, but ultimately it may not be the appropriate solution for a particular building. We have a history of metal roofs, as Mr. Hovis mentioned, and they do date back to the late 1700s. They became more prevalent for historic buildings, for residential buildings in the 19th century as uh, rolling mills came out. So you could get that. They used to be cost prohibitive earlier, but they became more popular later on. Uh, these were made with specific materials so they could be later painted for different colors. And the two that were the most appropriate for this time period in the 19th century would have been the batten seam or a standing seam metal roof. These are more prevalent in rural areas, but there are some in urban, and they are generally used on residential roofs with a gentle incline or on accessory buildings. Next slide, please. Some examples of what these could look like. Next, please. Next, please. And then next, please. Per chapter 161 of the Cleveland Codified Ordinances, the Cleveland Landmarks Commission follows the Secretary of the Interior Standards when considering the appropriateness of any rehabilitation project. Quoted here is the deteriorated historic features will be repaired rather than replaced, where the severity of deterioration requires replacement of a distinctive feature the new feature shall match the old in design, color, texture, and other visual qualities and where possible materials. Replacement of the missing feature shall be substantiated by documentary, documentary, physical, or pictorial evidence. The decision to use an alternative material should be weighed carefully against the primary concern to keep the historic character of the building. If a roof is readily visible, the alternative material should match as closely as possible the scale, texture, and color, colorization of the historic roofing material. Based on what the material that was proposed for the roof, it appears to be more of a corrugated metal material than a traditional standing seam or appropriate for that period. Based upon the architecture and period of construction, this would not be an appropriate material. Next slide, please. We have a list of what would be considered to be appropriate replacements for this particular roof. Next, please. And here's an example of one of them. Next, please. 
We understand that creating a more sustainable community is desirable and we support efforts to accomplish this. However, we also have to balance the appropriateness of these proposals within the context of the Secretary of Interior standards. The National Park Service understanding this technology would be desired issued a bulletin for guidance in 2010 on how to appropriately incorporate solar panels on historic properties. It should be installed in a location that cannot be seen from the ground. Installation that negatively impacts a historic character of a property will not meet the standards. Next slide, please. The proposed array on roof two is readily visible and would have a negative impact on the character of the house. It was proposed by the local design review committee and staff to relocate the panels from roof two to positions on roof one behind the cross gable. The commission, Lamarsh Commission, seemed to have less of an issue with the solar panels than the roofing material. The commission did not share Mr. Hobbs's opinion of dimensional shingles being unreliable. And after much discussion, as Mr. Pettit has mentioned, it was asked if it could be tabled, and then Mr. Hobbs asked uh, to have action be taken. It was moved and seconded that the project be denied as presented, and the vote was unanimous. Mr. Hobbs may return, but with a different treatment that would meet the standards. It shall also be noticed that since this was first noticed uh, in 2019 with the issues, Landmark staff had not been contacted at all by Mr. Hovis, as we could have given direction and different alternatives prior to him going through this entire process, which has led to some of the contention between the Landmarks Commission and Mr. Hovis. So in this, in this case, the proposal was found to be inappropriate and not meeting the standards. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brunges. Uh, Mr. Hovis, quickly, uh, can you just briefly describe uh, why you did not want to have the case table? Well, for one thing, I have a damaged roof I'm trying to replace, and I, I felt that they were being extremely unreasonable. I originally filed to get design review back in September, uh, had the design review. That was apparently, uh, first off, you know, and I reached out through Ohio City Incorporated, who's our, supposed to be our interface on this, tried to get some feedback. We kind of got the, yeah, it's, yeah, they've been approving those, you know, and you look around the neighborhood, they're there. Um, so I didn't pre prepare like a, a full presentation for them, explaining what was in the neighborhood, thinking they would know. That went badly. Um, so I decided to appeal to the full Landmarks Commission. Um, however, they were not able to accommodate us until mid-December. Um, at which point, tabling again, to me, was just essentially a attempted denial by delay, right? It's just, when was I going to, am I going to get a hearing again in three months? I mean, how many times do we, can I do this when I have a roof that needs uh, uh, replacing, right? They, the, somebody did bring up the issue of the striations versus a flat standing seam roof, and we could, uh, you know, we could make that change. That was made entirely in isolation and just a good faith effort on my on our part. Um, but, you know, again, that the the, um, the time required to get a response here is difficult, and then on top of it, they sort of, you know. Well, again, the the fact that the the response here didn't address 1800 Fulton uh, or 4110 Bridge, you know, as examples of, and and I know the owners of 1800 Fulton. They told me they had no issue with that roof with the Landmarks Commission. So why we're getting such a um, a, a hassle about it is is just unclear to me. Um, you know, again, we did attempt to reach out through Ohio City Incorporated. We were not advised that anybody at the Landmarks Commission. And and then once we had the denial from uh, uh, or the, the advisory from the design review, we did end up reaching out to Landmarks and we didn't get any helpful advice. We just kept getting told, no, 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 this would have to go to the Landmarks Commission. They, had a meeting with Mr. Brunges and, and Mr. Pettit, and they did not, other than the, their answer was, no, it's got to be asphalt shingles, despite the fact that we have numerous examples in the neighborhood, right? 
there are, I provided those, right? There's a, there's a dozen of them in the neighborhood that have all been approved of various different pitches, different colors, different you know, new versus historic roofs versus, you know, there's one on J where there's a slate roof house that has standing. Was, you, you presented sorry, that sorry. already. I hey, I'm sorry. Be, I'm I sorry. I to be but, clear on why you clear, did not want a table. I, just, I was not getting any sort of positive or helpful feedback except, you know, and, and again, the, the suggestion, unfortunately, that it keeps getting made of that we could somehow just magically move those shingle those solar panels backwards there you can see clearly there isn't room on the south facing roof to do that there isn't room there um if if there would i would try to be offsetting more than 50 percent, 52 percent of our usage right if there's more room for more panels there i we would be doing that um there just there's no room for panels there uh they can't be shifted the and you know the the economics of solar is there's a certain a lot of fixed costs associated with them so the more panels you can put up there the more quickly they'll pay for themselves right if you cut that the number of panels in half the time required for the panels to pay for themselves goes up quite a lot and your offsets going way down right um if we're going doing this we need to do this fully and again i point out 4110 bridge, you know. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Elvis. Yeah. Um, let's see. We got, we will go to the councilman now. Uh, Ms. Brown, can you swear her in, please? Councilman, do you swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give is the whole truth and nothing but the truth? Please raise your hand. Reply, I do state your name and your address, please. Uh, good morning, everyone. I do carry McCormick 601 Lakeside Avenue. All right, thank you. Go ahead, Councilman. Okay, can you hear and see me? Yes. Okay, um, I'm actually uh, traveling right now at a conference, so I appreciate the uh, me coming to you in a little bit of a weird space. Um, so thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and um, yeah, I'm not going to um, reiterate. I think Mr. Hovis provided um, a very thorough presentation, um, but just uh, a couple of thoughts to add to this as well. Um, you know, first and foremost, um, you know, I think the Hovis family has not only uh, been, you know, contributed significantly to this home, but also the community. Uh, so just setting the context, um, they are uh, a model citizens for our neighborhood and for the city of Cleveland. So. Um, you know, we want to do, uh, from my perspective, what we can to ensure that they have a safe and uh, leak-proof home and, uh, you know, are able to invest uh, in their property. Um, and as Mr. Hovis noted, they've already done that significantly to this historic structure. So I just put in that historic context that you heard today. Madam Chair, um, you know, just two, two quick thoughts. Number one, you, the solar, uh, I think this is something that we discussed at the last Landmarks Commission meeting. Uh, we really need to get our heads around this, and we're actually on council exploring the idea of exempting solar from the purview of the Landmarks Commission because of the incredible need for alternative energies with climate change coming. Uh, so I just really hope that when we think about solar uh, and you know the urgent uh, need to fight climate change, um, that we really think about hit think about it holistically, and think about how we can really promote and. Uh, solar within the city of Cleveland. I know it's a uh, key focus of city council and the mayor's administration uh, to uh, really think about uh, our building code and our entire footprint as a city and how we uh, really utilize green energy. Um, and then, you know, but really, I think what, what's in front of you today um, is this appeal. Uh, you know, I, I appreciate all of the context uh, that the Landmarks Commission has provided uh, for the decision that they made. Uh, but the key question in front of the Board of Zoning Appeals today, Madam Chair, is whether um, uh, this was an arbitrary decision. Uh, I have not seen any evidence provided by the Landmarks Commission uh, that would say otherwise, because uh, if all of the context provided today uh, were the guidelines that the Landmarks Commission operated under four metal roofs, then it would have been applied uh, to all of the other projects in the exact same historic district 
um, that have been approved by the commission. And I think that's the crux of the issue here today. Uh, I'm not going to get into materiality and, you know, uh, the specifics of, of this product. But the bottom line is, is that the criteria that's been presented by the commission has not been applied equally uh, when it comes to metal roofs and these decisions in this exact same historic district. Uh, and I think that is the fundamental question in front of the commission today. Why are some metal roofs a block away getting approved uh, and Mr. Hovis's has not? I think that that is really, and, and, and let me be clear, I, I very much appreciate the good work of the commission. This is not uh, a personal uh, uh, you know, issue, uh, but the bottom line is, is that uh, the question as to whether the commission acted arbitrarily here, I think is very clear. Um, the very similar uh, treatments have been approved by the commission in this exact historic district within the last, I mean, I don't remember the year, but very recently. So I share Mr. Hovis's confusion as to why his specific home was not approved uh, while houses a, a, a block away were recently approved with metal roofs. Um, so again, I think that while I appreciate the explanation and the context of the code and why the decision was made, the problem is, is that that, say, that, that context has not been applied equally uh, or fairly uh, to metal roofs and other properties within the neighborhood. And I think that, again, is the crux of the issue here, is not necessarily the details, uh, but again, the, my concern is that that criteria, that code, that rationale has not been applied equally to property owners uh, within this very own historic district within the very recent history. Um, and I think that that's why, you know, I would suggest that uh, this appeal be granted because um, out, even outside of all the context, even outside of the, their great family, they're investing in their home, um, all those things that you've heard today, um, the problem is, is that, um, you know, the exact same criteria has not been applied property owner to property owner. And while I understand that each uh, case is a case by case basis, I do think that the city of Cleveland uh, in uh, via its code and via, you know, uh, the criteria that it sets forth must do so in a way that uh, treats property owners fairly uh, and treats property owners with, you know, a, you know, the, the, the same or similar context to decision making. And again, I would argue that in this situation, uh, Madam Chair, um, we are seeing where the commission has uh, treated this property owner differently. Uh, and in the very recent history, um, you know, granted this uh, approval for very similar treatments uh, on multiple other properties within this historic district. So that's why, Madam Chair, uh, I would ask that the uh, Board of Zoning Appeals grant this appeal so that uh, Mr. Hovis uh, and, and his property will be treated the same as uh, other nearby properties that were granted uh, this type of treatment by this Landmarks Commission. So again, uh, appreciate the good work of the commission. Um, you know, we, we just advocated in council and we added another staff member to the team because of how, how good, all the good work that they do in the community. But again, Madam Chair, I think in this specific case, uh, Mr. Hovis was treated differently uh, on his property for a very similar treatment that uh, nearby property owners were granted by the commission. And that's why I believe the decision was arbitrary. Uh, and that's why I believe that uh, the appeal should be granted. Thank you so much for allowing me the opportunity to speak. All right, thank you, Councilman. Enjoy your conference. All right. Thank um, you. All right, I think we've heard from um, everyone. So I will open it up to my board for any questions or comments. If none, I'll entertain a motion. Madam Chair, just uh, just to clarify a couple things. Uh, to Mr. Hovis, um, I'm interested to know what your previous shingle, what the caliber of that uh, asphalt shingle was it that was you a, had failure It in? was a certain teed brand shingle uh, with, uh, I believe it had a 30-year limited warranty. Now, of course, those warranties don't really... Right. When they fail like this, do you, don't give do you, you much. Know what what uh, what category it was, by chance? 
No. I don't know of. Uh, I don't know if the, would that be Mr. Fess from First Choice might know that. I don't. Maybe. The shingle yeah. that's on there is a uh, certainty Hatteras shingle. Uh, and I actually believe at the time that was installed, it was probably a 50 year warranty shingle. It was actually okay. a very high end shingle uh, made to mimic the look of slate for coastal areas. Right. And um, OK, so it was the Hatteras. Uh, and Mr. Fest, what's the pitch of that roof? Uh, it's a 1012, I believe. OK, great. Um, and uh, to Mr. Brunch's uh, presentation, uh, Maurice, if we could go back to the slide that showed the alternative roofing materials, I just wanted to take a look at that. Okay, great. Um, Madam Chair, uh Mr. Brunges has raised his hand again. Go ahead, Mr. Brunges. I'm sorry. Did you, thank you, Madam Chair. Did you want me to address um, the 1800 Fulton issue as to why that one was allowed? Uh, I think you did in your presentation. Well, unless you want to quickly just, you know, I, I can be. The, uh, Maurice, could you go back up to that photo in Mr. Hovis's presentation? 1800 Fulton was a two part. It was not only replacing the roof on the historic portion, but uh, go up one more slide where he showed multiple examples. It was also a new construction addition. So here you can see in that middle photo, there was a new construction and then the roof that was being replaced at the bottom left was not an original roof to that building. They were replacing, as he showed in his next slide, that it was a uh, dimensional shingle. So for a uniform look throughout the entire building, that's why the standing sea metal roof was approved on this because it's an addition and it's tying into new addition as well. Okay, thank you. Okay. Go ahead, Ms. Faith. Okay. Uh, we've had compelling testimony from uh, both landmarks, uh, the homeowner and the uh, councilman. Um, and uh, this is a very steep pitched roof. Um, and it, it seems that um, there, there's a number of roofing choices in this situation. The homeowner has chosen the one that is uh, most conducive to uh, working with the solar panels. And it seems, uh, given the testimony of the councilman, that there are other projects, and we've seen other projects in the, in the area that are using standing seam um, and uh, it, you know, the question is, do you err to the side of uh, the ecological choice or the aesthetic choice? And it seems that um, uh, the decision was made to err to the side of the of the uh, historic choice. Um, and it seems to me that that may have been an arbitrary decision in this situation, uh, though. Uh, something that would normally be the consistent choice. Uh, anyway, with all the testimony taken in, into account, Madam Chair, um, uh, I would uh, pose the motion that um, the decision in this particular case may have been arbitrary and that we might, that we move to um, uphold the appeal grant the appeal um oh, yes. yes uh very well uh summarized miss faith may i have a second please member brown i second miss brown with the second go ahead call the roll miss kugler thank you madam chair miss brown yes miss faith yes miss Britt. yes calendar 22-106 has been granted we will send the appellant a letter next week after the case is ratified. I would just like to thank the board very much for your professionalism in this matter. Thank you.
Thank you. All right, moving on. Moving on. And uh, we no longer have uh, Councilman McCormick on with us, correct? Correct. correct. So we move to calendar number 22-022. This is at 1010 East 146th Street. Zarel Patton proposes to establish use as a residential facility for a maximum of five residents in a B1 two family residential district. The owner appeals for relief from the strict application of the following sections of the Cleveland codified ordinances as stated in the agenda and the public record of which there are. Two. To Miss Brown for the oath. I am swearing in all who are present for this case. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give is the whole truth and nothing but the truth? Please raise your hand. Reply, I do. State your name and your address, please. Who's here for this case? The Hanson. Um, 1029, it's 146th Street. Anyone else? I do see the applicant, but he's muted. Please push star six, Mr. Patton. If you're on the phone, oh, there we go. Good morning, good morning. Sorry please, please raise your hand, say I do, state your name and your address. Zarel Patton, 1010 East 146th Street, Cleveland, Ohio, 44110. Okay, anyone else for this case? Madam Chair. Thank you. History of the property, please. I mean, actually, I would like to postpone it. I heard you say uh -huh. earlier, postpone it. Um, just like to postpone it. Just this, I and mean, to be honest, this is my first time being on a, zone, on a zoning and board appeal, so I didn't have my material prepared. So just would like that's to. A good, that's a good reason to postpone it. Um, <laughs> we like to have people be ready. Exactly. Um, all right. So how much time do you need? Um, A few days. To be honest, um, well, we already have a rolling agenda, so it'll at least be 30 days. So, um, okay. do you want the first one that comes up in 30 days or yes? Yes. Okay. Ms. Kukla, what, what dates do we have? Uh, Madam chair, if I can um, also let the applicant know, we received a letter from the councilman. Um, mm -hmm. he stated that he has not spoken to the applicant and would like to have time to. Um, speak with him and include the development corporation. So just to let the applicant know to uh, contact the councilman as soon as possible. I do have contact information if he would like me to send it to them. Uh, um, yeah, I have his contact information. Okay, perfect. So yeah, Mr. Patton, yeah, make sure you talk with the councilman and try to um, talk to the community as well of what you know of what you're trying to do. Like try to knock all those things out before you come to us. So okay. Okay, thank you. I appreciate it. I'm sorry, Liz. Go ahead. So, Madam Chair, um, 30 days is, I believe it would fall uh, April 18th. Yes, that works for me. All right, it's postponed to April 18th. We'll send out another letter uh, in the mail and the link closer to the date of the hearing. All right, and Mr. Patton, if you find that the date's coming up and you're, you haven't gotten everything together yet, just let Ms. Kukla know and we can put you on a, on a different date, but don't let it come up and go past, okay? Yes, ma'am. All right, thank you. Thank you. All right, moving on. All right, that we go to calendar number 22-023. This is at 3105 Franklin Boulevard. TDG Franklin Realty owner proposes to change the use of a formerly elderly care complex to 38 apartments. The owner appeals for relief from the strict application of the Cleveland Codified Ordinance as stated in the agenda and the public record. 
and there is one item. Actually, Alana, can you just read that? Because I think it's important to have that out. Sure. Thank uh, you. So, absolutely. This is section 359.01A, which states that no substitution or other change in such non conforming use to other than a conforming use shall be permitted except by special permit from the Board of Zoning Appeals. Such special permit may be issued only if the board finds after public hearing that sub such substitution or other change is no more harmful or objectionable than the previous non-conforming use in floor or other space occupied in volume of trade or production in kind of goods sold or produced in daily hours or other period of use in the type or number of persons to occupy or to be attracted to the premises or in any other characteristic of the new use as compared with the previous use. Apartment complex is not permitted in a two family residential district. That Thank concludes, you, yeah, that concludes the reading of that and to Ms. Brown then for the oath. Certainly. So I'm swearing in all who are present for this case. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give is the whole truth and nothing but the truth? Please raise your hand, reply I do, state your name and your address. Hi, uh, I do, Andrew Irusi with the Dallad Group. Um, our office address is 6055 Rockside Wood Boulevard in Independence, Ohio. I do. Um, I do. Oh, uh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, I do, ahead. Donald Tedit, 601 Lakeside Avenue. Um, I do, Jeff Gibbon, uh, the architect for the project with Gibbon Architecture. We're at 3012 Chadbourne in Shaker Heights, Ohio. Anyone else? Madam Chair. Thank you. History of the property, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. The property was originally zoned to multifamily in 1929. In 1985, it was placed in the current two-family residential district. In our records administration office, I found that in 1928, a permit was issued to erect an apartment slash dormitory. 1929, a permit was issued to erect a gymnasium. 1960, a permit was issued to erect a passageway from dormitory to the sister's home on the site. Um, also in 1960, a permit was issued to convert the gym to a private chapel and convert a brick house to an administrative office. I did find one variance on this address, calendar 87-1, sorry, 315. A permit was issued to convert a former office area to a dormitory. And then in the more recent history, I found that there were yearly food licenses issued between 2005 and 2018. And that's all that I have. Thank you. Legal standard, please. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board. A felon is requesting permission to substitute one non-conforming use for another or alternatively a use variance. And I would just state that the provisions of the code relevant to this would um, basically deal with how long the building has been vacant. If it has been vacant for more than two years, it generally would not be considered a valid non-conforming use, in which case then the board would look at the use variance standards. So I will read both. I'm not really sure what the facts support. So it says, if the elderly care is a valid non-conforming use pursuant to the chapter standards of chapter 359 of the zoning code, then the use may be changed to apartment use if the board finds after public notice and public hearing that the proposed substitute wow. use is no more harmful or objectionable than the previous non-conforming use in floor or other space occupied, in volume of trade or production, in kind of goods sold or produced, in daily hours or other period of use, in the type or number of persons to occupy or be attracted to the premise or any 
characteristic of the new use as compared to the previous use. If pursuant to the criteria of section 35902B, the previous use has been discontinued for such period of time so as to no longer qualify for a valid non-conforming use, then appellant is requesting a use variance. And to obtain the use variance, appellant must prove that denying the request will result in an unnecessary hardship, particularly to the property, such that there will be no economically feasible use of the property without the variance, will deprive the appellant of substantial property rights, and that granting the variance will not be contrary to the purpose and intent of the zoning code. <coughs> Thank you. Um, who will be the spokesperson for this case? I will. Andrew Arusi again with the DALA group. All right, Mr. LaRussi, go ahead. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, the, the applicant TDG Realty, Franklin Realty, is uh, an affiliated entity with DALA group. Um, just uh, a little quick background. We're uh, um, based in Independence, but we consider ourselves a Cleveland-based real estate company. Uh, we've done a, a good amount of work in the city of Cleveland. Uh, actually, most recently, um, not too far from here um, as well with Gibbon Architecture, um, a similar historic renovation project in Ohio City called Tinnerman Lofts. Um, so uh, we purchased this property um, on Franklin uh, at the end of 2018. Um, within about a year, we received a historic preservation tax credit award from the state of Ohio. Um, not too long after that, we received uh, approval from uh, local boards and landmarks to do some initial phase demolition of non-historic connectors. There was mention of a, a permit uh, at one point for a connector from what was originally built as the, the YWCA dorms apartments on 31st to the sister's mansion, uh, which is the house that you see kind of at the forefront of this rendering with the mansard roof. Um, so we've since uh, taken that uh, connector piece down. There were some additional non-historic kind of connections made between that gym building, which is the red building you see kind of at the back, um, kind of lower right corner of this rendering. Um, and, uh, and then also we had a permit for interior demolition. Um, so we've, we've pretty much taken this building down uh, to to the shell inside so that we can start uh, hopefully the proposed renovations with approvals. Um, our plan here is to renovate it into 38 apartments, 31 of which will be in the two buildings uh, on 31st Street. Um, and maybe actually it would be helpful to switch to a, a site plan if we could now. Um, there's kind of a nice, uh, so this this was kind of, Previous, this is what it looked like at the time that we purchased it. So you can see there's that connector closer to Franklin Boulevard uh, that spans across um, from 31st to 32nd. That has since been removed. There's a driveway off of 32nd that at, at that time dead ended into a, a building uh, connecting the historic home and the, the recreation gym building that has since been removed. Um, further down in the presentation, there's kind of a colored rendered site plan of our proposed project. Um, on page page 30 of the PDF. It might be different. I think they pulled a few pages out of, of kind of. Oh, did they? Form. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But. Uh, yeah, let me let me try and find that for you. Thank you. Ah, this one. There it is. Yep. That's good. So. Um, kind of uh, with, with our projects, um, we always try to create kind of a. Um, a an interior sort of uh, courtyard green space, um, you know, that in this condition presents a, kind of as a nice front yard, also gives the residents um, some some outdoor amenity space. Uh, but so building two is um, what I was referring to on 31st Street that holds the majority of the units. Again, 31 of the proposed 38 are in those two buildings. Those were built by, again, the YWCA when they purchased at that time two kind of uh, historic homes um, for the organization and subsequently tore one down to build these as uh, what they called one uh, an apartment and, and the other uh, um, a dorm building. Uh, the house on 32nd Street, our proposal is to put seven apartments in there, uh, four of which are on the uh, first floor, three on the second floor. Um, the majority of the parking for this is provided in 
uh, the lot um, at 31st and Franklin on the opposite side of the street. Uh, that was all um, part of what the the uh, uh, the group that we purchased the property from had used had owned, um, and they used that for their parking. We also have added uh, an additional kind of interior parking area, predominantly to provide um, a few more spaces and ADA accessible spaces uh, to the buildings. Um, building three uh, that the, what was originally constructed as the gym building, it later became a chapel for the second users of this property, which I think were a group of nuns. Um, we haven't determined exactly what our use is for that, so we've kind of said TBD. Um, we, we've ideally kind of thought, uh, just to, to give you some information, that it'd be a good spot for like a neighborhood retail or or um, kind of small creative office user, uh, but that's that's pretty much um, on, to be determined at this point, undecided. So, um, trying to think, uh, this is, you know, we, we've largely aimed to deliver this as what we're considering kind of a workforce affordability um, new apartment product in the neighborhood. We heard that from early on with our meetings with the community that that was sort of a missing component here. Um, so we are also working with the city um, economic development to try and help us um, uh, achieve that through some programs that the city offers as well. Um, I think that's about all the, uh, the basic details that I can provide. Um, happy to answer any questions uh, at this time, and Jeff's here too as well to to uh, chime in on the architecture. Jeff, anything you think I missed that's important? No, no, I think you covered it all, except bike parking, which is one other thing too. Um, just because I know that's that's part of the planning code. There's surface bike parking and additional bike parking in the basement that we're providing as well. And I, I guess I. Sorry, I was just saying I alluded to it. Uh, we met with the neighborhood early on, um, but did eventually um, this past uh, summer receive uh, the block club's kind of vote of, of, of approval and support of the project. Um, subsequently, design review and landmarks have have also uh, given approvals on this. All right, well, that's a great segue to Mr. Pettit. Go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the Landmarks Commission approved this on October 28th of last year uh, uh, for all the buildings on the campus. Uh, it's really a great project. Uh, the uh, The restoration of the Cook Bousfield House is going to restore a really significant Franklin Boulevard mansion to its original glory. Uh, the Sisters Home is also significant in, in its own right. Uh, the developers have been very sensitive. Um, in, in, in terms of this restoration and also to the to the new setting for all of these buildings. I think the landscaping and and has has is really going to enhance this corner. So we support the project and we have no objection to the use or the variance. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Maurice, anyone from city planning here or will be you? There's nobody else, and I, I really, at this point, I don't know what else there is to possibly say about this project. Right. Just to e echo Don and everyone else, it's broadly supported by the community. The, the Landmarks Commission is, thinks very highly of this project. It's a great project bringing these buildings back to life and the thoughtful renovations that they're doing. They've provided parking for cars and bicycles. Uh, we fully support this project. All right, thank you. All right, board, I'll entertain a motion unless anyone has any questions. I do have a question, Madam Chair. I'd like okay, to know ahead. what is the bedroom mix for the 38 apartments? Yeah. Um, Jeff, can you, uh, do you have that offhand? We typically. Yeah, have... I do. It's actually, it's, it's in the Thank lower you. left. Thank you. I couldn't read sheet. it before. Thank oh, you. Oh, sorry. So there are of the 38 apartments, there are 26 one bedroom apartments and 12 two bedroom apartments. Thank you. Is that all, Ms. Brown? Yep, that's it. All right. Okay, thank you. And all I'm, right. uh, Madam Chair, if I may, I would ask Maurice if he would please zoom in on the site plan for me a little tighter. Sure. Further than that. 
I is there a particular uh, area you wanted to see? No, I just kind of wanted to take it in, but I, I can zoom it myself a little more from there. All right, that's good. Um, I'm encouraged to hear that they were thoughtful of both ADA parking and access and also bicycle parking and access. Um, are there elevators in the buildings, gentlemen? There are, yeah, there's an existing elevator um, that currently serves uh, first, second, and third floor. Um, we are also adding um, uh, kind of um, an ADA platform lift that will go okay. from first floor to the basement area where there's some amenity spaces um, and, and some additional uh, indoor bike parking, a couple um, units uh, as well. Um, and um, and then there's that kind of like a sunken entryway. So this platform lift has a couple different stops so that there's full ADA access throughout the building. Great, that's good. Um, and are there dedicated ADA units or no? Yes. yes. Um, there are, sorry, right. I'll just jump in on that one. Yeah, there are um, five five percent of the units, which is what are required by ADA, um, which in this case is two apartments are up to um, the full accessibility type A standard. Okay. All right, excellent, excellent. Um, that answers my questions, Madam Chair. So I'll go ahead with the motion. Uh, given the testimony we've heard today, the approval from Mr. Pettit from the Landmarks Commission, the full support of city planning from Mr. Rulins, um, and it sounds like we've had uh, community review and also CDC review that are in support. Um, I think we're, we're also in agreement that this is a good looking project. Uh, they've provided parking. They've been thoughtful about uh, special needs to other individuals and for active transit. Um, and it's a revitalization of historic buildings. So that's, uh, great, particularly in this neighborhood. So with that, Madam Chair, I uh, move that we approve um, calendar number 22-023. Thank you, can I have a second? Member Brown, I second. Ms. Brown with the second, go ahead, call the roll, Ms. Kuka. Ms. Brown? Yes. Ms. Vape? Yes. Ms. Britt? Yes. Calendar 22-023 is granted. It'll be ratified next week and we will send the appellant a letter. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Look forward to seeing this come to fruition. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. All right, good luck. Thanks. All right. Old our business. Case. Yeah, we're on to yeah. old business. Yeah. Old business one through three without objection. Without objection. No objection. All right. And no, oh yeah, nothing else. All right, we're done. That's it. I had a question. I had a question about 22018 uh 4420 East uh, 156th Street. That's the fence case in the front yard, the vinyl fence. I I oh, yeah. sure uh did we want a site plan? I don't think we wanted a site plan for that, right? No. Okay. No. I didn't request one. Okay. No. I'll just I just wanted to to confirm that before uh before I put it on there for approval for ratification, I mean, so. Um, um, Chairwoman, did you want to go into executive session or did you want um, to do that the following, you know, uh, next week? Or? Yeah, we'll do it next week. Okay, sounds good. Yeah.